So today I have the pleasure of wrapping up our inclusion series and I've been given the lovely small topic of how do we love our neighbor, which is a big question. We've been actually studying this specific question at the evening service and the series is still, we're about halfway through it. So if, if you've enjoyed this inclusion series and you've not yet been to the evening service or actually if you just wanna catch up on some of the really specific questions we've been asking about how we do this well, I'd really recommend you either come along this evening and start uh, by listening to Tim Sunderland or you can catch up on YouTube. But today we're asking this question about loving our neighbor and what I wanna do is set a bit of context around one of the most famous stories we have about loving your neighbor and where it comes from, which is the Good Samaritan. Brownie points for anyone who already knew that that was coming. And then what I wanna do is ask two big questions. How can we love our neighbor? And why do we love our neighbor? And hopefully this will nicely wrap up our series. Now, Maddie and I have been reading The Hunger Games together. Hands up if you've read or read The Hunger Games or seen the movie a long time ago. Yeah, fine. Slightly, better, slightly more than The Lord of the Rings, which was the last book I just finished. I'm doing a recap of all these books I should be reading. And this book has been fascinating to read. I watched the movies a really long time ago, and everything that people said about the books is true. Really hard to put them down. It's a very quick page turner. And there are these two really significant moments in the book so far that have made me think about this idea of loving our neighbor. And this is uh, taken from the movie, and it's the very famous scene where Katniss uh, sees that her sister has been selected to enter the Hunger Games. And it's this horrific uh, tradition that's been set in this uh, dystopian future where basically uh, young people are just selected at random to take part in a gruesome set of Colosseum-style challenges. Uh, and, it's, and it's this horrendous thing that you might get called up to do. And the book tells the story of how Katniss, the older sister, when she sees her younger sister selected for the games, says, no, I volunteer as tribute. Some of you have seen it. I volunteer as tribute. I will not let my sister go through this. I will do this in her place. I can't have her go through this. I'm going to do it. And then this other scene uh, that also has so much to do with this idea of loving your neighbor is this wonderful, unlikely, surprising friendship that takes place between Katniss from one district and a little girl called Rue. Uh, and we've just read a specific chapter in the book that both of us were basically crying at, but I won't tell you what happened if you didn't read it. But this is a really unlikely friendship because they come from different districts. And the book is really built around this concept that in order to maintain control of the population, everyone was put into really specific districts. No traveling between them, no interaction between them. They encourage competition and you don't support one another. You definitely aren't friends with people from different districts. And then they get thrown into the games together, these two girls from different districts, and they form uh, a partnership, a friendship, and that is unheard of. You're not supposed to do that. And it's a big way that the book kind of looks at this idea of what does it mean to overcome these barriers that we have, and how do we see people as neighbors and friends and allies when it might have been surprising? And I think that the book is really successful because it plays off of this truth, you can nod if you agree with this, that we are scared of what we don't know right? Do, do you, can you relate to that at all? Whether it's a new food, a new genre of music, a new person, whatever it might be, we are often scared of what we do not know, what we do not understand. We like boundaries, right? So we like when we say, this is where I exist. These are my boundaries. This is what I know. This is what I like to do. Everything outside of that is weird and scary, and I'm not too sure if I want to get involved. I think this is the idea of where a modern neighbor comes in, right? Because supposedly we have these boundaries, we have these walls in terms of a house or a fence or something like that. And if, like Maddie and I, you've ever lived in a flat or wall sharers, as a friend of ours referred to it as, then these boundaries get blurred, right? It's no longer you and you have this big separating thing and your neighbor, you're very much in each other's space, whether it's noise or uh, putting the bins out, whatever it might be, the, the boundary is blurred. And we like boundaries because we're scared of what we don't know. We don't want to interact with it. But what we see in the Bible is this call to move through the boundary into what we do not know to explore how we can love our neighbor. And actually, the Bible gives us a reason why we should love them as well. And that's why we are going to look at, at Luke chapter 10, 
and the story of the Good Samaritan. I would like, if you have got either on your phone or a physical Bible, I would like you to try and get hold of that to read it along with me. Um, I'm going to be talking a little bit about what's happening before and after the story as well. You see, in Luke chapter, in the book of Luke, uh, this gospel in the New Testament, it's broken up into three parts. The first bit, chapters one to nine, is filled with stuff that Jesus did. So it's often referred to as the deeds of Jesus, chapters one through nine, all the, th- the many miracles, the people he met, the stuff that he did. Then, and the story that we're reading is in this transition period where it moves from deeds into words of Jesus, the teaching. What is it that he says? How do you live? How can we follow him? He teaches for this middle section before it then closes with the passion story about Jesus giving up his life for us and combining the deeds and the words together. But what we see here, starting in chapter 9, is this beginning of a, a move from what Jesus does to what he says. And this is where the story of the Good Samaritan takes place. What you will see, if you just look at, I don't know if your Bible like mine has got the little headers above the different sections, but as a whistle-stop tour, if you look at chapter 9, verse 51, that's the beginning of this section, this whole bit of this flow of Scripture. We often break it up in by chapters and by verses. Sometimes that's not very helpful. But the section begins at chapter 9, verse 51, and what we see is this, Jesus sets out on a journey, and it's a journey that will eventually take him to Jerusalem and this final part of the story, his passion. But he begins that journey here, and he goes to, uh, he's going to the homes of some people in a place called Samaria, I'll show you a map in just a moment, and he's not welcomed there. They don't allow him into their homes. Then there's this little bit of teaching you can see in the next section where Jesus says that it's really difficult to follow him. He talks about the cost of being a disciple and how it's not an easy thing to be a Christian. Then he has this encounter with a teacher, so an expert in the Jewish law at the time. And he asks this really unusual question, Lord, what do I have to do to inherit eternal life? What do I have to do to inherit eternal life? And then comes this story of the Good Samaritan, which I'm going to read now. So you can either listen to my lovely voice, uh, or you can read along in your own mind as well. I've not got it on the screen, unfortunately. So this is Luke chapter 10. Uh, We're going to read from verse 25. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? classic teacher move here, reply with a question. What is written in the law? He replied, how do you read it? He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your strength and all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this and you will live. But that wasn't enough for the guy. So he says this, he wants to justify himself in asking this question, but who is my neighbor? How often do we do this, right? We get given this instruction and these, when we say, Lord, but what do we actually have to do? Can you make it easier for us? Give us a checklist. What do, I, what do I actually have to do to get by? What's the minimum requirement? Give me something I can handle. Don't give me this big command to love you and my neighbor. Just break it down for me. And this is important that we see what's going on here because it's in response to that question, Jesus says this. Okay. A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road. And when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too, a Levite, which is another term for a a, a priest, uh, someone who would have been in that circle, So too, a Levite, uh, when he came to the place and saw the man, he passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, and remember the story I've just told you that Jesus went to go and stay with the Samaritans just moments before this story, and they refused him entry. A Samaritan, at this point, the crowd are going, oh, the Samaritans. A Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was, and he saw him and took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. 
Then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day, he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have incurred. And Jesus then asks this question, which of the three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? The expert in the law replied, because he couldn't even bring himself to say the name, the one who had mercy on him. And then Jesus replies, go and do, not exactly the same thing, because that would be too easy. Go and do likewise. Go and do likewise. So let me try and ask these two big questions. How can we love our neighbor? And why should we love our neighbor? Jesus' answer to this question highlights two main things I want you to take away today. Tom Wright said this when he read this passage. For Jesus, in his answer, he explains that God is a God of grace for the whole world, not a specific people group. And a neighbor is anyone in need, not the person that you share a wall with, not the person simply that you work with or your family, anyone in need. And so what we can determine from this is that actually, how do we love our neighbor? Well, the act of neighborliness is to care for anyone in any sort of need. Absolutely anyone that is in need, the act of caring for them, that is how we can be neighbors. Okay, fine, but but who's anyone in need? But, But who is it? Our our neighbor is anyone that fits into this because God's grace is for all. We are all made in his image. We are all loved by him. As we've just been reminded by through some of the songs that we've been singing, we can't box this out. We can't say, well, it's just people that look like me, eat like me, listen to the same music as me. It's anyone that might have need. Now, in the context of the series that we're doing, we're doing a series on inclusion, okay? So uh, we've been talking about how to stand up for people, how to defend people, how to love people really, really well. So in the context of inclusion, how we love our neighbor might look like the four Ds of being an active bystander. Everyone say active bystander. Active bystander. Thank you. Just checking you're awake being an active bystander. Now, if you were British, you might want the four Ds of being an active bystander to be dodge, duck, dip, dive, and dodge, i.e. I don't want anything to do with being an active bystander. I don't like conflict. I don't like dealing with other people's drama. No, thank you. I'm not up for that. How do I dodge and get out of the way of this? I don't want to be involved. I'm really sorry to be the bearer of bad news. The Bible does not give us that option. We are not allowed to be people who dodge, duck, and dip, and dive their way out of helping our neighbor. The Bible says if you see an injustice, you must speak up. God has given you a voice. You must use it. So instead, we have four Ds of being an active bystander. They are direct, distract, delegate, and delay. Now, we might try and make this something that you you can find this anywhere online. This is a really easy resource to find. But I just wanted to offer a quick reflection on this. We have so many examples in the Bible of people that challenge oppression and defend their neighbors using these techniques. And often in the Bible, they're quite extreme examples. So it can be useful for us to reflect on them and think, okay, how am I most likely to be an active bystander? When I see something going wrong, somebody being oppressed or spoken to in a wrong way, How can I love my neighbor using some of these techniques? When we're talking about a direct challenge, this is literally inserting yourself into the situation and getting involved at the moment you see something happening. There are many famous examples in the Bible of this, again, quite extreme. Everything from Jesus observing that the poor are being exploited in the temple, and he goes nuts, and he says, no, this is not what religion looks like. This is not what faith looks like. You are exploiting the poor, and he flips the tables over, he drives people out, he really gives it to them. He says, no, this is not right. He's directly challenging what's going on. And this for us might look like being involved in protests, signing petitions, taking part in bigger movements. But equally, if you see a friend or someone that is being spoken to in an inappropriate way, it is directly, actively getting involved. 
One of the other techniques is about distraction. This is an excellent one. So actually, it's about potentially uh, moving the topic of the conversation away, trying to, to eat, you know, this is a classic one for me, somebody who hates confrontation. How can I get, skirt the issue and create a situation that's safer by moving the conversation on? There's a very famous one of Jesus again, where a woman is caught in adultery, and this, this group of religious leaders says, look at what this woman has done. She deserves to die. And what does Jesus do? He distracts them. He starts writing in the sand. And everyone's thinking, well, what's this guy doing? We've just asked him to pass judgment on this woman, and he's busy writing in the sand. And then all of a sudden, he turns the tables on them and asks them, which one of you is without sin? And so all of a sudden, there's been a distraction. The conversation has changed. So what would it look like for us when we see someone being spoken to in an inappropriate way, somebody being oppressed or judged? How can we actively distract or use our conversation to take the eyes off of the person in trouble? There was an excellent story. Um, if you've not watched uh, Joe and Zoe having their conversation um, at the front a few weeks back, you can watch it on YouTube. It was excellent. Zoe shared a great story of how Marion stepped in and distracted a group of people when they were just pestering Zoe about something that she didn't want to be pestered about. And Marion was like, oh, uh, it's, it's Easter. What are you doing for Easter? Excellent, excellent example of distraction when you need to save someone from an awkward situation. There's a great example of delegation in the Bible. So to delegate is when you don't feel capable of getting involved yourself. Sometimes it's not safe to, and that's okay. Knowing our own limits and what's safe is really important. And there's a great example in Philippians chapter 4, verses 1 to 3, of where Paul is addressing a situation that he cannot get involved in because of physical distance. And he says, look, guys, there is this massive argument going on between two believers. I cannot be there. So please, on my behalf, and he addresses his good and trustworthy companion, he says, I plead with you, help these two to make amends and to start getting on. Paul cannot be there in person. It's not right for him to do that. And so he says, look, I'll go and find someone else. And so for you, when you see something happening, if you don't feel it's appropriate for you to get involved, that doesn't mean you can't do anything. Find someone who might understand the situation or be friends with the person delegate the responsibility, be an active bystander, ask someone to help. And then finally, delay. And this really is probably where the Good Samaritan comes in. Sometimes the situation is too difficult, it's too risky or too dangerous, or you're just, you just don't want to get involved immediately, so you delay the action. Now, the Good Samaritan arrived after this incident had taken place. He saw someone hurting it is so important that if someone has had an injustice done to them, that we care for the victim, right? Can we nod? Can we agree with that? We need to care for people after this incident has happened. If it's happened, you've missed it, and you saw something happen, it's not enough to just say, oh, well, I missed my chance. We need to try and care for people after this incident. We need to love our neighbor after things have gone wrong. And the Good Samaritan shows us how to do that. He takes care, and he doesn't just sort them out there and then, continues that relationship as well afterwards. So what would it look like for us as a church when we observe people that have been hurt to try and find a way to care for them after that moment? So we've talked a little bit about why, uh, sorry, about how we can love our neighbor, but what I want to do is to ask the bigger question of why we get involved. You see, Jesus replied to this really big question, how do I love my neighbor? With a story that, to be honest, is so outrageous, a lot of commentators would say that it's borderline ironic or at least really sarcastic. There's another story you need to have in mind when you think about this answer. Do you remember the story of the rich young ruler? He approaches Jesus and says, Jesus, what do I need to do? Almost an identical question, to be saved. Jesus knows that the guy's rich, so he says, Take everything you have and give it to the poor. And the Bible literally says the words, the young man went away sad because he was rich. Jesus perceived the heart of the question and said, if you're going to do it in your own strength, the thing is almost impossible. And so he gives him this extreme answer. That's why this story is so, so extreme. Because the idea that a Samaritan would help a young man who had been attacked on the road from a different part of town, the idea was outrageous. It was preposterous. Think of the two most extremely different demographics who have a seething hatred towards each other. 
a Labour and a Conservative person, a Manchester City fan and a Man United fan, whatever you want to think of, it, we can't get it extreme enough. But these are two groups that don't even mix, let alone be nice, let alone incur a cost, a sacrifice to help the other. And Jesus says, if you're going to love your neighbor in your own strength, this is how extreme it will be. And we must be aware that Jesus is doing something really clever here. And this is what I wanted to finish on and to actually wrap this series up with, which is this question of why. Why do we love our neighbor? Because for the rich, uh, sorry, not the rich young ruler, for this expert in the law, the reason for why was wrong. The priority was wrong. He comes to Jesus and says, how do I inherit eternal life? Do you notice the phrasing there? What do I have to do to get eternal life? What in my own strength, in my own merit, what can I do to get eternal life? Give me the checklist. And effectively, the answer from that, of course, fine, okay, if you're going to do it in your own strength, the answer is hold up every letter of the law. If you can be morally spotless, absolutely perfect, no wrong thought, no wrong word, no wrong action ever, then you can fulfill the law and that's fine. And so self-righteousness is the method. That's the way. I've done it on my own. And so that is why Jesus replies with this extreme story. And uh, I couldn't help but think of uh, Simon Sinek's Golden Circle. Um, I run a creative studio and I'm a graphic designer. There's a business that I run. And sometimes I get called in to help brands think about their strategy. Why do they exist? What do they do? And one of the methods we use helps you figure out priorities. What do you exist for? Why do you do this? Becky's nodding away. She understands we've done this. And you know, how do we connect the dots? And Simon Sinek created this golden circle formula. And in the beginning, he says, you've got to figure out why. Why do you exist? What is motivating you? What is the purpose of your brand, your organization? But it's true for us as people. What is the big why? The title of the book that he wrote with this in it is, starts with why. Every good organization starts with this question. And then you've got to move to this outer circle about these products you might have, the things you do, the services, the actions you take. And then how can we make a connection? Because people always need to see a consistency between these three circles. So as an example, let's talk about Google. Google, if you don't know what the word Google means, it's, uh, it's something ridiculous, like a one followed by, I think it's a million zeros or something absurd like that. So they've picked the name because their mission their why is, how can we organize the world's information? That's a massive why, isn't it? Why do we exist? We want to help everyone organize all of their information. Just that small task. We want to do that. Okay, fine. So then you talk about the what. Okay, well, let's have a bunch of applications. Let's do email. Let's do maps. So you can literally see anywhere in the world. That still, like, blows my mind. Let's do maps. Let's do Google Meet so you can meet each other online. Uh, let's do photos. Let's make a phone. Everything. Let's make all this stuff. That's their what. But then in terms of the how, what is it that connects these things together? Well, okay, we've got these incredible products and we've got a why. So how do we join the gap? Let's make it all really easy to use and free. Let's mind-blowing. Again, this is world-class technology, absolutely system-beating and defining. Let's make it free. Let's have everybody have the opportunity to access all of this stuff. So do you see how there's a connection there and there's a consistency? Does that make sense? If I'm talking a different language, I'm so sorry. This is how my brain works. But what I'm seeing here is a really core existence. Why somebody exists, what they do, and what joins them together. Jesus wants to realign our priorities. Because the person who asked him the question had it all wrong. What have I got to do to, to, to get eternal life? Love your neighbor. Okay, yeah, but how? What's the checklist? What do I want to do this? He had it all wrong. Because in the center of the why should not be, how do I inherit eternal life? It's relationship with Jesus. That is the most important thing in life. Your personal relationship, not your mother's relationship with Jesus, not your grandparents' relationship with Jesus, your, your children's relationship. The most important thing in your life is your relationship with Jesus. That is the why. And then Jesus goes on to explain 
the, the way that that works itself out, what sort of things do these people do? We love our neighbor. We love the world that we're in. And what's the how? What's the method? How can we, get, how can we become people that do that? Well, we become like Jesus. And so the story comes full circle. At the beginning of this narrative, Jesus went to stay in Samaria, and they didn't welcome him. He was at the beginning of a journey, and he said, it's not easy to follow me, but all I want is relationship with you, and I want you to follow me. Because when you do that, loving your neighbor becomes a consequence. It's the easiest thing in the world when you are following me. If you don't follow me, you'll be doing it in your own strength, and it's going to be really difficult. But if there is a relationship, if the why becomes relationship with Jesus, loving our neighbor flows really naturally. So church, can I encourage us as we finish up this series on inclusion? What are your priorities? Why is it that you want to do things the way that you do them? My encouragement, let's put Jesus back at the center of it. Try to become more like him. Enjoy that relationship with him. And as we do that, we will be people who are excellent at loving our neighbor. Agree? Yep. Let me pray for us. Father God, we thank you for this truth that you call us to love our neighbor as we love ourselves and as we love you. God, I pray for every single person that's listening either today uh, here in this building or maybe online later on. God, would you speak to us right now and help us to discern whether or not our priorities are in the right place? God, I pray that we would not be distracted by trying to fulfill a law by trying to complete a checklist, by trying to do everything in our own strength. But instead, Lord, help us to fall more and more in love with you and to enjoy that relationship with you so that we could be people who love our neighbors excellently. God, I pray that by your Holy Spirit, we would all be really observant when we see things happening where you call us to step in. Help us to be active bystanders, not because we feel like we ought to, but because we want to, because we love you and we love our neighbor. Lord, help us to be these people. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.